thanks a lot everyone for uh, joining our webinar. We're going to, we promise to keep it nice, short and sweet today. And uh, the topic is the top triads that separate a digital marketing agency, a successful digital marketing agency from an unsuccessful one or from an average one, uh, so to speak. So, you know, uh, I myself have been uh, a digital marketing agency owner for the last 13 years, been in the sales field for the seven years before that. So I have some experience in that. And then now the co-founder of RepStack, which is our uh, virtual assistant uh, service uh, providing uh, virtual assistance to digital marketing agency owners specifically and in three key roles specifically. And we'll talk more about that when, when we get to that point. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's very easy to kind of let go once, once your agency is starting to do, you know, $5,000, $10,000 a month and, you know, you're, you're starting to see good, good things come in, uh, cash is coming in, you quit your job. But going from that two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars to a million dollar or a seven figure agency, that's a completely different ball game. And we're going to try and get you uh, to, uh, to get you to see some of those points today, where you know just doing these key nine things that we've identified uh, really easily should be able to uh, get you out of this uh, uh, vicious circle if you're there and uh, on to seven figures and beyond. So, so you, my name is Azar Siddiqui. I'm the co-founder of RepStack. And uh, it's, uh, it's a one-year-old uh, baby of ours, but uh, we're having a huge amount of success in growth just because we were able to uh, apply the same formula that we're going to be telling you today, which is uh, well, the, the number one thing is focus on a niche. So we did that for ourselves and we saw like a huge, huge success in our first year. We just turned one year. Uh, we're over 150 people uh, as of today and uh, things are going very, very good. Uh, working with digital marketing agency owners uh, like yourself. Uh, I'd like to introduce my co-host today, uh, AJ Cassetta. AJ, you want to quickly introduce yourself, my man? Sure thing. So, um, so yeah, I'm AJ Casada. I'm a B2B sales consultant, been in sales my entire career, basically since I've been 18 um, and uh, co-founded Revenue Boost, which is a uh, sales training consulting company. And similar to Azar at RepStack, we focus on helping agency owners grow. So um, I'm super excited for today's training because, yeah, I mean, just from working with tons and tons of agencies, I've really seen the patterns and I know Azar has as well. And um, yeah, we're really going to share the do's and don'ts. And I really love what you said, Azar, about how you might get to one level and then you just hit a roadblock and you have to change what your approach to get to that next level. So the skills that got you where you are are very different than the skills that got you um, that are going to get you to that next level. So um, just really excited to bring a lot of value here today. So let's dive in. Awesome, man. Uh, thanks for doing this with me. Um, AJ is a great uh, sales consultant and uh, we at RepStack, Believe it or not, uh, we've gotten to 150 people with a lot of organic growth. And uh, the biggest thing we were struggling with was our sales department. And we've engaged uh, AJ and his uh, consulting firm to come in and build out our entire sales department. And uh, he's kind of working with us on the back end as well. So really excited for uh, uh, that as well. And I think AJ, your specialty is working with uh, agencies uh, mostly as well, right? Right. Yeah. I've been in the agency space myself for almost five years. So um, when I started the company with a niche I chose, and we'll get into the importance of picking a niche today, was I said, where can I give the most value? And it was to marketing and creative agencies. Um, so um, yeah, again, just really familiar with what it, what, what the very successful ones do that the average ones don't. And um, mm -hmm. can't wait to, can't wait to share. Excellent. So, so let's, let's dive in and talk about our first point, which is um, the importance of focusing on a niche. So AJ has done that. I've done that with RepStack. And I know a majority of the clients that we're working with right now, uh, we're working with close to 70 clients, uh, digital marketing agency owners, um, who are the, the most successful uh, uh, people who are running their digital marketing agencies are focusing on a particular niche. Um, so picking the niche is extremely important. Like most of us do start out with a generalist agency and, you know, generalist agency is not a bad thing, uh, to get the ball rolling for you guys. 
gets you the experience and things like that. But um, the biggest drawback of being a generalist agency is that every time you bring on a new pr uh, project, so say, say you're working with a uh, flooring company, so they're selling carpets and things like that. You're crushing it for these guys. All of a sudden, you bring in a blinds, uh, blinds uh, company in the, in the local market again, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, the same website's not going to work. The same marketing material is not going to work. Uh, you're going to have to kind of reinvent the processes for this new business niche that you've taken on as a project. Uh, wouldn't it be a lot better to have the focus on only blinds companies? So say you, you must have a client or two that you're really, really cr crushing it for. I'd uh, recommend if you are an agency who's already doing five to $10,000 a month, take a look at who you have, who you're crushing it for. That This is a way of how you pick your niche. And, um, and uh, you already have results coming in. You already have a case study ready to go. And, and now all of a sudden, instead of focusing on your local market, uh, for example, me, I've been a generalist agency in Calgary, Canada. That's uh, where I've spent uh, most of my uh, last uh, 20 years. Uh, you know, I, I've been working with condo management company, flooring companies, blind companies, and God knows, right? And it's been a it's been a struggle every time you bring these people on. Every niche is different. Every type of marketing material is different, and uh, it's just just a struggle. And sometimes, you know, the clients would come back to you, and they're like, "Where are the results? You get results much faster in a particular niche. Uh, in some other niches, you may not have cracked the code yet." So instead of doing that why not pick a niche like blinds, for example, which I know is extremely hot right now, um, and, and open up yourself to the entire North American market. Like, wouldn't it be great to have that uh, recurring revenue in that niche and just be able to go and tell your clients that I specialize working with blind, blinds companies. And um, I've, uh, I'm, I've been working in Calgary, Canada, Vancouver, uh, Houston, and these are all the case studies. I'd like to take you on as a client. So, so I think I think uh, picking out a niche is extremely extremely important. Uh, that's uh, you, you know, like I said earlier, most of our clients who have a niche picked out are crushing it. Um, you know, our own example, RepStack. We are focused on working with people like you, digital marketing agency owners, and uh, we've seen phenomenal growth um, because of uh, the focus on our niche. And uh, why don't you jump in and uh, chime in on this a little bit, uh, AJ, on the importance of uh, picking a niche for a digital marketing agency? Yeah, I think you covered some amazing points. And I know probably most people here watching this have heard this over and over again, pick a niche, but it's really, really so, so important. Um, again, from all the agencies I've worked with, they've always had a niche. Um, and I think it, it, the stages matter a lot too. Like you said, in the beginning, it's okay to be a generalist because you're trying to figure out picking a niche is partly a business decision. It's partly a personal decision. It's like, where can I give value? Where can I really help people the easiest? What do I enjoy? Um, so you really have to kind of play around to, to find where you are best fit. You can't always just figure it out through research. So when I first started freelancing and building an agency uh, before I left my, my corporate job many years ago, uh, my first two clients were a bagel shop and a landscaping firm. So it's like all over the place, but obviously that's not a very scalable business model. Um, so I think at least how, how it was for me and how it's been with every company I've started and with, again, a lot of agencies I've worked with, you might be broad in the beginning to find your focus. Then you get laser focused. And then maybe later you can start to get a little bit broader, very strategically, because um, maybe, you know, like once you're at least focused and you master a niche and you have all the processes down, then you can look at maybe a related niche. Um, but I think what holds a lot of people back is they... You know, I think success is more about saying no than it is about saying yes. So when you pick a niche, you're going to have to be prepared to say no. Um, of course, you can still stay open-minded to some projects depending on what it is, but really like you need to, you need to be okay with saying no um, and realize that no matter what niche you pick, the opportunity is probably massive. So a lot of people feel like, oh, if I just help auto dealerships, like, can I really build an eight-figure company? Yes, you can. Even in some very obscure niches, you can build a massive, com a massive company. So don't feel like you're limiting yourself picking a niche and realize that you can always change it later. I think that's a big mindset thing is we feel like maybe it's permanent. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be married to this niche for my whole life. What if it doesn't work out? Just look at it um, 
like a marketing campaign. Look at it as an experiment. You know, you could you could pick your niche based on what you think is going to work best based on auditing your maybe most successful clients and where you've had the most fun. Um, and then from there, it's just an experiment. Don't think about it's going to be permanent. Um, but the other thing that I took out from what you said, Azar, which was really smart, was how every area of the business is affected. So I know that maybe if you're watching this and maybe you're a one or two or you're a small agency, um, you know, it's maybe it's hard to think about all the departments in a company, but really by not having a niche and by taking whatever just comes your way, all of the departments get affected. Like Azar said, operations and fulfillment is more difficult because you have to create new processes for each niche. Sales is way harder because if you know, if you're a generalist agency, I mean, guys, we probably all know have friends with agencies as well. There's a lot of agencies out there. So sales is a lot harder. Sales is already very, very hard. Um, and when you, when you don't stand out from the competition, it's even harder. So the way I like to think about it is if the pie of potential clients is this big. So let's say you're just a digital marketing company. You have the biggest pie ever. There's so many other agencies, but if you're a digital marketing agency that specializes in SEO, okay, the pie is a little bit smaller. There's less competition. If you're a digital marketing agency that specializes in SEO for, um, for restaurants, now that's a little bit smaller. If you're an S a digital marketing agency specializing in SEO, now it's becoming a tongue twister that also, <laughs> also focuses on Mexican restaurants. How many other agencies out there that even do that? Maybe not any. So like I always look for the low hanging fruits in, in business and in marketing and sales. So rather than trying to go after everything, like good marketing and good strategy and good positioning makes sales way, way easier. So you can just make it way easier and it's easier to become number one in a small pond than it is to become number one in a big pond. And the last thing I would say on this point is if you think about Amazon, they are basically like the everything store. Um, they sell, you know, you can find almost anything on Amazon, but they started with just books, right? So it's the same with all businesses, not just, uh, not just agencies. Yeah, some great points there, AJ. Um, I think uh, the last thing on the uh, focusing on the niche side is, uh, again, like what you said that, you know, pick a niche, stick to it. You're not really married to it. I've right. seen people who are, uh, you know, who've kind of picked out a niche and didn't work out. They moved it and they've been extremely successful in the, in the, in the new niche. So, so hiring a coach, uh, a person who can help you guide you um, can also benefit over here. You can kind of uh, shorten the learning curve over here. Um, I recommend Josh Nelson. Uh, we use uh, Josh Nelson as our own coach. Um, so de definitely look at him at the seven figure agency. Uh, so moving on to the next point, this one is kind of a uh, bonus because, uh, it's uh, probably not on the slide deck. Uh, if the team hasn't shared the slide deck yet, please, uh, uh, share it in the chat. And, uh, this one is say no to project work. So I think this is going to be extremely important as well to your next step, uh, uh, inside your agency where, you know, you only, only want to focus on retainer based clients. So uh, I'm sure most of you guys understand what a retainer based client is. A retainer based client is somebody who pays you on a monthly basis. So, so this would mean that uh, you're, you're, they're engaging you for your, for your SEO services, your Facebook ads, your Google ads and things like that. And uh, you know, and the things like websites, uh, anything that you used to do on a project work site, you can just throw in as a package. So come up with two to three different packages and uh, just only offer these retainer based services. Imagine having, you know, having a 2000 or $3,000 retainer kind of middle of the way, which covers the website, covers the SEO, covers some Google ads. Budget is always on top of these and uh, having 10 of those, right? Uh, 10 times uh, 3,000, you're already at $30,000 in uh, monthly recurring revenue. Uh, you go from 10 to 100, you know, you're a $300,000 company. Uh, uh, yeah, so, 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 you know, retainer is the way to go. I would, uh, I would shy away from project-based work. Uh, as long as it's paying the bills right now, you know, you got to do what you got to do, but your future should be moving towards retainer based clients. Have you had any uh, success in uh, retainer versus project based uh, work? Uh, AJ, what, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I think uh, for sure it, it depends on um, what you're doing, but retainer has always been the best, the best way to go for me. And then, you know, like we, 
we work with marketing and creative agencies, but in all different niches. And yeah, the pattern is the guys that keep clients for a while, it's, uh, are the ones that are more successful. So it's, I think it's even, you know, when I, when I'm hearing you talk about it, it's, it's not even, I'm not even thinking about it as retainer or project. I'm just thinking about client retention and long-term, um, yeah. client retention and ascension. Right. So, yeah. um, cause you know, like, just being dedicated to sales my entire career, one thing I learned is that sales is hard. Like even for me, I, I would consider myself a sales expert, but I don't close 100% of the, the people, I, uh, the deals I sit down with, you know? So um, if you realize that like, no matter, no matter what you're doing, there's still a good amount of energy to acquire a client, uh, to go from a stranger to a paying client. It's mm. a lot easier just to focus on bringing in revenue by keeping that client over a long period of time. Um, so that's also another low hanging fruit, which is, yeah, related to having a yeah. retainer. So instead of going for a $5,000 website project, go for a $3,000 a month project, which in turns, uh, turns into a $30,000 client at the end of the year for you. So, right. uh, so way, way better in the long term. and clients would, cause these are all long-term projects. So, you know, clients would usually tend to stick with you as long as you have the, uh, you know, uh, the, the stuff on the back end that the deliverables figured out. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So, so just moving on, the next point is, so you figured out your niche, you figured out that you're going to stay away from uh, project-based work. You're going to move over to the retainer side. Now it's time to get your first five clients. So getting your first five clients, uh, you want to get to that point in as little time as possible. And, uh, you know, at this point, what you want to do is that you want to do everything in your power to get to those points. So whether it means picking up the phone and calling your friends and family, that's always the best. Like if you can convince your fr friends and family, then, uh, you know, th th there might be a problem. Um, so, so, so start out there in your inner circle and work your way up there. Uh, cold outreach is a huge one that will get you your first uh, first client. So uh, get a list of, uh, you know, you figured out the list, uh, the, the niche that you want to target on. There's different platforms that you can get uh, uh, data uh, for these particular niches. For example, SIC code uh, is uh, one of them that I've used in the past where you can just purchase. Uh, uh, we have a list of, I think now we have a list of 30,000 digital marketing agencies uh, that we haven't even tapped into. Um, so having that list of your niche is huge. And now you want to start running some sort of cold outreach on this, uh, using email marketing as, uh, as, you know, as the front and center, uh, but then also applying sales assistants and appointment setters who would be calling these people up as they start opening up your emails and things like that. And uh, I think, I think between that, and uh, the, the focus of your niche. Uh, and if you already have a case study within your niche, then you, know, you already have a case study. So now you can run a case study campaign to your target market, your acquire list, uh, cost you maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars max, start running a cold email outreach campaign with some case studies in there. If you don't have a case study, you work out a lead magnet with, uh, you know, how to go from you know zero do doors for a for example a condo, condo management company uh, you should go from uh, uh, how you can go from 10 doors to 100 doors uh, by using facebook ads or google ads so you can easily turn this uh, into uh, you can easily turn this into a lead magnet which is helpful to your target audience they'll get something in uh, return from you and you continually send out uh, email emails of uh, five to six. Usually, they work best uh, in our on our side. But uh, but yeah, AJ. So what what are your kind of tips and tricks on getting the ball rolling for an agency owner who's just recently picked out a niche and wants to get to their first five clients ASAP? Yeah. So I think um, the first thing which you touched on is just making it a priority. How many how many times you know do we how many times I'm sure maybe people watching this have maybe got stuck in the trap of doing a million things that aren't sales. So I think like one of the biggest traits of successful agencies is that they have a relentless focus on acquisition. Um, sometimes maybe I might be sitting down with an agency and they want me to help them with sales, but I might hear, Oh, I'm, I'm just too busy to focus on sales much the next few months. 
And if, you, if that's really the case, you may not have an agency in three months. So sales is the lifeblood of a company and we need to always keep doing it. And no need to think you know, crazy far ahead right away. Just focus on the next five. Uh, just keep it a very simple goal. But as far as, um, as far as that, so first make it a priority. And by that, I just mean do something every day. Even if sales scales you or, or if, it, if it's the kind of thing where you, know, you have some fear around it of reaching out to people or sitting down with clients, Generally, I found that things that scare us are the things that we should go dive right into because there's usually a lot of growth in that. Um, but just just know that if you're in if you're in business, you're not just providing a service; you're selling a service. There's no if ands or buts about it. So you need to just get used to it. The only way to get used to it is to do it, um, and um, just do something every day, even if it's really even if it's something that you don't make a big habit of. Just maybe make a checklist. Like today, did I do something to either prospect or to close deals? Um, so make it a priority. And as far as methods, there's like, if you search online, how to get clients for an agency, you're going to find a thousand different things. Um, so just try to pick one or two that you can really focus on to not overwhelm yourself. Uh, as Azar mentioned, cold outreach is one of the best things you can do because you get a very fast feedback. You know, if you wanted to start a YouTube channel in a niche and maybe it takes t 12 months to actually get people watching you and 12 months later, you find out that you don't even want to be in that niche anymore. It's not really a good situation. So Cold outreach is a great way to test your niche and to test your messaging because it's basically, of course, there's softwares that help, but it's basically free to go out and send emails or message people on LinkedIn or Facebook. And you can get a very fast response to what is my, is my messaging working? Um, is the targeting working? Do I need to change something before you waste too much time? So I would just say, go out, make it a priority. Um, don't try to do too many things um, and focus on helping, not just selling. If you, most people, what I see in their emails, it's always about hey, this is me from this company and we offer this and we're amazing at this, but nobody really wants to hear that in their inbox. They want yeah. to hear, hey, I, I heard about your company. It looks like you have some great reviews. I really like, really like X, Y, and Z. Um, after reading your website, I thought that maybe we could partner or we could help you with this because of this, w whatever it is, but keep your messaging focused more about the prospect and their problems because selling isn't selling your company. Selling is helping people solve a, solve a problem in their business. So it's a, lot, a lot of our clients, just, just to add a, uh, one more point to that uh, on how to get to your uh, first five clients and even beyond, a lot of uh, the clients we work with, uh, they do these cold outreaches in very, you know, like digitized formats where they'll, they'll, they'll be sending these emails out, but they'll also be sending out a Loom video recorded by the owner of the company doing an audit, live audit of their website. So, you know, if you can record like a two, three minutes and you just do... 10 of these a day, um, just seeing the ball roll on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, there's no way you're not going to get traction out of that. Back in my agency days, I, I did it all wrong. And, you know, I could never get my agency over uh, a particular amount, usually around 300, 350,000 uh, a year, but it was a one man show, just me. Um, so it was, you know, the, the money I was making was more than enough, but uh, I would go from being a salesperson, a, a marketing person to a salesperson, to an account manager, and just do that circle constantly. And I remembered like, as soon as I dropped a client or two, and I'm all of a sudden, I'm in, you know, this, this mode where, you know, need to bring money in because need to pay the bills next month. And uh, really, like I, I had a list of maybe 500, 600 clients uh, that I've worked with in the past. And what I would do is, I would just start calling five to 10 people on my list that I had on a daily basis. And that's it. That's all I really usually did on the sales activity. And that was enough to, you know, some clients I haven't talked to for years, you know, they're like, oh yeah, my website is too old and blah, blah, blah. And I'll get work going. So, you know, just have just doing like what AJ just said right now, just doing those activities, but on a regular basis they have a huge impact in the long term. So, so you know, just small things, simple things, um, they will definitely get you there in your, for your first few, few clients. And some of these things you should continue doing uh, even as you go into six figures and uh, become a seven figure agency over time. So moving on uh, to the next point, which is, so you, you figured out your niche, uh, you figured out that you're going to be moving towards a retainer based model. And, um, and uh, you figured out how are you going to uh, get to your first uh, five or 10 clients, what you want to do now is focus on your fulfillment. And, you know, again, you know, you might be somebody who enjoys doing coding a lot, 
I understand that. That's okay. Um, you can still from time to time do that. But your role uh, as an agency owner is to grow the agency to the next level and bring in, start bringing in a million dollars in revenue a year or $2 million in, in uh, revenue. If you're stuck behind a computer screen, uh, coding websites all day long, I can guarantee you that that's not going to happen. Yes, you can find people who can uh, work below you and they can, they can deliver work on your benchmark. But I would say that's way too early for that to, to start hiring your team and things like that. Because right now you want to just do, you want to hire and you, you want to close a deal and you want to take that recurring revenue. And part of that recurring revenue, you should give over to the pros. And there's a lot of outsourcing companies that you can find who can do your take over your web development work, who can take over your Facebook work, uh, who can do uh, your uh, Google ads and things like that. You might even be lucky uh, to find somebody who can do all of these things for you in one umbrella. And you want to find somebody who's Who's, who has good experience in this thing uh, because you want to deliver a world-class product and you may not have enough left over. Um, uh, so if, you're, if your uh, uh, retainer is $3,000 a month, you can easily find somebody between so $1,500 to take care of all the work on the back end for you. Uh, and you still have $1,500 uh, left over uh, to do the other things that you want to do, pay yourself uh, and other things. But initially, I would highly recommend uh, do not build out a team, do not hire people, just simply outsource this work. It's going to be a lot less headache. These guys have experience in doing this a lot longer uh, probably than you. And even if you have experience in building out websites, you may not, uh, you can't possibly tell me that you're excellent at building out great world class, class websites. And then you can also do amazing Facebook ad campaigns. And then you can also do Google ad campaigns. It's just not possible. You need a pro for that. And the time will come to build out your agency where you're starting to build out your internal teams. But that time is not right now when you're below $10,000 a month. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that, AJ? Yeah, I think you covered um, covered a lot of the really important points. You know, I would just say that um, I think a lot of this is mindset. We we get scared of releasing releasing control over the work, especially if we're like attached to the work and we really take pride in it, which is amazing. But you mm -hmm. have to, you know. And I actually was having this issue recently in my own business because we just hired a full time sales rep, and I was like, I'm just I really want to find the right person that could be as good as as good as I'm doing the sales. And then um, my friend was like. Hey, you don't need them to be as good as you. You need them to be 60 to 80% as good as you. That's totally fine because there's a lot of opportunity costs when you do everything yourself. Um, you basically, you put, there's basically, if you can imagine there's a, there's a ceiling above you and, you and what your business can produce as far as impact, revenue, profits, yeah. clients you can serve. And every time you bring someone on board or you find a, a partner to outsource, then that ceiling gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So whether or not, you know, you're, you're limiting yourself if you're just doing it yourself. But it depends if that's what you want to do. If you just want to be a one man show and just build a couple websites a year, that's yeah. totally fine, but you can't have both. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's such a great point. I, I love that point. Um, you know, bringing in people and delegating it's, I, I understand it's, yeah. it's not yeah. for everyone. Uh, you know, I've been there where, you know, like I was a one man band and uh, you know, I didn't have to a big team used to be, uh, a control freak, but it was just, it was just a hindering block for my growth. Like I could have never gone to the next level uh, if I had continued uh, doing things the way I was doing. I was wearing multiple hats uh, going from, and which, which uh, brings me to the next point is, you know, you, you figured out all of these things initially, and um, now you're going to get to that point where you're making 10, $15,000 a month. And, uh, and this is, this is the pit that you want to avoid. Uh, I got stuck in that for a really, really long time. And uh, seems like Groundhog Day for me, you know. And uh, the biggest mistake I made was that uh, I didn't hire for three key roles. And, uh, you know, as agency owners, we, we tend to have access either outsourced or internally. We would have the best web designers or we, some of us would be doing it themselves. Uh, we'd have uh, the best Facebook ad people, the graphic design, the Google ad people, 
you know, all the deliverables are getting done really good at a really good quality, but uh, there's more to an agency uh, than getting the actual work done. And I would say it's even more important than the agency work because, you know, there's so many resources out there from Upwork to uh, Fiverr uh, to hiring locally inside your teams and things like that, where you can find these uh, talented people to do the work for you. And you can set your own benchmarks and you can relinquish control to these people. But when it comes down to these three key activities, and I'm going to point these out to you in, uh, um, in a format here. So number one is your marketing assistant. Uh, the number two is your appointment setter. And number three is your project manager. So these three key roles, like most like, you know, by the time I realized 10 years later that somebody can do these things for me inside my agency, I was like, it was a eye opener for me. And we don't even realize that we can get people who can do these things for us. Um, and the reason you want to start out with a marketing uh, assistant is because you want the marketing engine to start functioning first before you bring on your sales assistant, because the marketing person, you know, you're doing a great job working for clients, doing a great job doing their marketing. But what about yourself? Your own agency needs somebody uh, to start pulling in uh, these leads for you on a, a consistent basis. So having a marketing assistant run your cold outreach campaigns, run your social media campaigns, um, you know, do a lot of these things that you just, you know, barely have time for because, you know, you're doing some marketing activity. All of a sudden you have to jump on a sales call. All of a sudden you have to do a client onboarding. So having somebody there, uh, doing this eight hours a day, uh, 80 hours a week, 160 hours a month, that's going to be a complete game changer for you. So now the marketing engine starts running. Leads start coming in on a daily basis almost. We are right now at RevStack. We're booking two, three, sometimes four, sometimes up to seven discovery calls. That's because we have a marketing engine in place now. And uh, so, so once you have this marketing assistant in place, now you move on and you find a strong appointment setter uh, that comes in and you have all these leads coming in, you have funnels built out, you have an email outreach campaign going out, people are opening your second, third, fourth emails. Now your appointment setter goes in, he already has or she already has a foot in the door. She goes, look, I saw you, John, that you opened my third email. I just wanted to see if you have any questions for me. So that cold outreach is not that cold anymore all of a sudden. This appointment setter now comes in, They've got leads. They're calling 100, 150 people a day for you, booking one to two appointments a day for you. Now this uh, sales cycle starts coming in for you. And then from there, the last person you really, really want to focus on, we are, uh, I've been guilty of doing that, you know, being there for my clients all the time is the account manager. Trust me, there is a better way of doing that, um, which is hire somebody uh, who is a account manager for you and who is in a client facing role. So you don't have to, you step back from the face-to-face uh, -face on the client side, somebody else, as long as you take a look at their, the type of personality they bring to the table, it's outgoing and uh, they would like to help people and they have a good understanding of digital marketing. This is the perfect person that you want to bring to the table over here and let them take care of your clients because, you know, you might be really good at account management, but if you're doing all these three things together, I can promise you uh, there's going to be balls that are going to get dropped. So if you don't want that, I've done that. I'm sure a lot of us have done that in the past. If you don't want to do that, plug in. As long as you know how you have uh, five to 10 customers, that's usually a sign where you want to have an account manager in place and uh, get this person plugged in and imagine having uh, impact where on retention, where this person's sole responsibility is communicate with your client and uh, make sure that they're happy at all times, regular check-in, sending out the reports, upselling them. We had uh, three uh, sales that came in last month uh, just from our CSMs, the client success managers or the account managers. And they have these great relationships with their clients where clients just say that I need another VA and I need another VA. And these uh, ladies are uh, easily able to upsell them because they have a great relationship going. So trust me, an account manager can do a way better job than you can because you're not there all the time, right? So uh, anything you'd like to, I know there, it was a mouthful there, AJ, three different roles, but uh, anything you'd like to add, I know especially on the sales assistant side, uh, you have a few things uh, to share with us. 
Right. Yeah. I think the, you explained it really well. Um, I would say as I'm listening, I'm just trying to think of what are, what are the reasons people get, where, where do people get stuck in that process? I think first it's not knowing the roles. So, I, so I think it's amazing you explained it like that, because if you're just doing everything, it feels like I'm just running my agency, but realize there are roles, you know, so that those are the three key ones. Um, and you could even just go and look at like job descriptions of other agencies to see like, how do they explain those roles and what are those responsibilities? You know, so first it's realizing those are the roles. Um, and then also, again, just getting yourself out of the mindset that you need to do all of it yourself because you will drop the ball. Even if you're an amazing account manager, but you're not focused on it that much, you're probably going to drop the ball in some ways. And I feel like, you know, with agencies and professional services, the relationship is half of the work. You could do, how many of you watching this, um, T type in hashtag underappreciated in this chat right now. If you've done great work for a client and they didn't notice it or they, did, they didn't value it. Um, it's happened to me. It's happened to all of us. Um, I had a client when I first started back when I was in generalist mode, we helped him take his e-commerce store from 1,000 to 10,000 a month in like three months, which I was like, wow, man, that must be changing this guy's life. But then he let us go two months later to cut costs. I was like, cut costs? What do you mean? We just made you an extra nine grand a month. But you know, it was my fault because I didn't communicate the value that we were bringing to it. I thought it was obvious, but that's what we don't want to, we don't want to assume, right? That, that's a really great point uh, there, uh, uh, AJ, because I think the number one reason that clients leave an agency is perceived indifference. You know, you think that things are going great, but if we're not communicating those, like even, you know, getting a keyword to page one, your account manager should be jumping on the phone and relaying that information with the client. And if that's not happening, there's going to be a perceived indifference. And that's the only reason a client would leave. Like if you're in constant right. communication with your clients and again, you know, that role, uh, I promise you that somebody else can do way better and for way cheaper than what the amount of money that uh, an agency owner is paying himself right now. So, uh, so, so that's, that's a huge point, man. I just wanted to chime in. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, and the, you know, the way I think about it is let's say that you are going to pay a, a virtual assistant, um, $20 an hour, $15 an hour, by you doing that work, you're valuing your own time at 15 to $20 an hour. So are you okay with that? Or do you want to make yeah. more than 15? To 20? Cause you're basically making 15 to $20 an hour, probably less because there's opportunity costs you're leaving on the table from not doing the higher level things. Um, but yeah, just think about what you could, what someone else can do. And it's probably almost all of your job. Um, I know sometimes I've totally gotten cost lost in the trap of thinking that I'm special. Only I can do this, but I'm not, people can probably do it way better than me, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's just the mindset needed for, for growth. And yeah, you asked about the sales side too. So you brought up a good point that you want to get marketing pumping first. So the sequencing of how you build your sales team is very important. If you hire a sales guy, a closer, and you say, Hey man, we're going to have you tons of appointment on your calendar. This happened to me once I, I had a sales role a while back where there was that expectation and there was like only five calls on my calendar for the whole month. And I was like, okay, obviously this isn't going to work. So you could really lose good talent if you don't structure it in the right way. So make sure your marketing engine is set up first before you drop that sales guy in. And how awesome would it feel if you could have somebody setting appointments, closing deals and handling the clients for you? I'm sure for some of you, that seems like a dream. Like, no, this, this is just a movie. This isn't real. I used to be there, AJ. I used yeah. to be there. I used to think that, you know, God, when is that time going to come when I'm going to see, <laughs> yeah. you know, deals come in and I don't have to do the sales. And right. Uh, right within the last one year, uh, the first year of RepStack, uh, I was doing, doing most of the uh, sales and closings and things like that. But for the last six months, I haven't had to close one deal. And, uh, awesome. you know, yesterday we closed four deals in one day. And these are like, you know, $24,000, $25,000 deals um, a year. And uh, my sales closer is doing all of that stuff. You know, like the entire process is working together uh, to deliver that. And such a great feeling to see that uh, sales order channel on Slack, uh, you know, with a new sales order uh, popping up and you're out and about with your family having a coffee or something like that. So, uh, so you know, it's possible. I've, I've grinded 13 years in my agency uh, to get to this point. It hasn't been easy. But there, there's definitely a shorter way to get there. And that's exactly what uh, AJ said, that follow the sequencing, uh, start with the marketing, uh, and get in uh, into that uh, the, the sales uh, appointment setters and the sales closers. And then you move on to your, uh, your account managers and so forth. So these th 
key roles are so huge in agencies and most agency owners don't even realize that you know they understand that web developers yeah all of these things technical people we need to get them but what about these three key roles these i think are the most important roles inside right. a digital marketing agency that we need to hire for for sure all right sounds good so uh we're uh, nearing we're already over uh time but uh just a couple of last points over here um so so you know so you, you you've gone into all of these things uh hey uh, mishu the marketing team can we just quickly uh plug in uh the VA hiring guide over here, because that's going to give a lot of you perspective on if you're making a hundred, hundred and ten thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars from your agency, and you're still doing these uh, simpler tasks in your agency, you're actually losing money. You can actually step back from the day to day, and you can actually make more money by hiring somebody for two thousand dollars a month or something like that. So I think I think that'll be a good uh, plus uh, for everyone who's on here. Um, the last point that I want to quickly make is that, you know, you're going through all of these things. Uh, you you want to continue to grow your agency now. And how you're going to be able to do that is with two things. Number one is social proof. Col start collecting social proof as soon as possible. Like this is video testimonials. This is Google ad, Google reviews and things, the Facebook reviews and things like that. And the best people who can get you these is guess what? Your account manager. You may or may not have the time to do that. We have three amazing uh, CSMs and uh, in less than a year, uh, we've gotten over 50 video testimonials from our clients. So we run these ads on Facebook and we get a ton of uh, social proof out there and people book uh, discovery calls by looking at how these other agency owners are doing that. So, so, you know, so if your account manager is there, her responsibility should not only be to make sure the client stays with you, but also get these social proofs for you and then become omnipresence. I think um, being inside your niche because you've picked out a niche, it's so much easier for you to uh, be the authority inside your uh, agency's niche. Uh, like what AJ and I are doing that right uh, doing right now, this is to build authority inside our agency um, because this webinar is going to be recorded. There are some of you who are watching this live. We're going to be sending this out to maybe seven, 8,000 people by email uh, who are going to be watching the rerun of this. We're going to use parts and snippets of this. My marketing team is going to be on it already. They have a process in place. They're going to cut this into bite-sized pe bite pieces, and they're going to start publishing this content on social media. They're going to run the best pieces of this content on ads, um, that we can uh, uh, show to our target audiences and things like that. Uh, publishing a book, I'm not there right now, but publishing a book definitely makes you an authority figure inside your niche and it's easily doable. You can outsource that work as well. Don't think that you're alone. You can, you can always find people on Upwork, Fiverr and things like that who can help you out, set up your niches, setting up your lead magnets, uh, which can be downloaded, used as face uh, for Facebook ads and things like that. So, so being everywhere inside your niche, you know, could be a ten thousand per uh, ten thousand company uh, company wide uh, database that you have. Uh, it's a smaller piece of the puzzle, like AJ said earlier, but uh, it's a lot easier to become uh, the go-to coach or the go-to digital marketing agency for roofers inside the USA versus being the number one digital marketing agency for every type of business in the USA. So, uh, and then out of those 10,000 people, you just need like a 0.5% market share and uh, you could be well over uh, a seven figure agency. Anything uh, uh, lastly you wanna add as uh, closing remarks, uh, AJ? I know there's just a couple of questions uh, I'd like to get to that after you're finished. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would just say, yeah, omni-channel is amazing. Like we met, we did mention earlier that you want to maybe focus on just one or two channels in the beginning, but that's because you want to be, it, it's all about focus, right? The more focused you are, the faster it's going to go and the better you're going to get. But then over time you want to expand because you want to stay top of mind. And the cool thing is other opportunity, that's when your business can really evolve and grow in ways you didn't expect. I did a free speaking gig recently. Somebody reached out to me that saw it and they said, Hey, I'd love to hire you for a paid speaking gig inside of our, our company's internal team around uh, content strategy so it's just cool like what what can start to happen and what can start to come to you really that's actually how i found aj just on social media because he's pumping out content all the time and uh you know content that is related to my niche 
you know, uh, we, we were in the process of looking at a few other people, but Asia and I connected the best and uh, we decided to go with Asia just because he's out there, he's targeting his niche, he's pumping out the content constantly. So he's the authority figure uh, inside my niche. Uh, he's got the most amount of experience. I, I rather hire somebody uh, who's worked with digital marketing agencies uh, or agencies right. in general than somebody who's ha had set up uh, corporate uh, and, you know, brick and mortar stores, sales and things like that. The experience is good there, but uh, I want to focus on niche because it's worked for me. I know it works for a lot of my clients and that's the direction I want to go in. Thanks a lot, AJ, for doing this for me. Um, really, really appreciate it, man. Sure. Thanks everyone uh, coming on this uh, webinar. There's just one question over here from Jeff. Um, when should I hire my uh, virtual assistant? And I think the answer for that is once you have 3000 per month, uh, more than your expenses, because you obviously want to pay yourself first, but if you, as soon as you have $3,000 left over, uh, I think that's the time that uh, you want to hire your first uh, and that that first person should be your marketing assistant so that your marketing engine can start humming. Uh, then you move on to your appointment setter and then you move on to your uh, project manager. So uh, uh, if you guys have any more questions, uh, we are at repstack.co. Uh, AJ, what's the ad website address or how can people connect to you? Um, best way to connect right now, because um, we're just rebuilding our website, so um, we're switching over the domain, um, but our company is Revenue Boost. I would just say join our Facebook group, B2B Sales and Marketing Secrets. We share tons of good stuff in there. Also, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. Um, but just to add real quick about the virtual assistant, I would say $3,000 a month, just the reasoning behind that so you guys understand. You can get, of course, you can get a virtual assistant for 200, 300 bucks a month, maybe, but if you want someone really good that you can really trust, um, you know, think about $2,000 a month. So if you have, if you have someone that's full-time, that's really do, you know, handling a lot, handling your clients, that's a very important role. $2,000 a month. That means if you have $3,000 a month extra, you have a thousand dollar runway for, uh, for yourself. And then your business will explode from there. And yeah, guys, just check out RepStack because they, they're the best in the game I've seen about hiring, training and placing, um, talented, uh, talented employees and virtual assistants. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone. We'll talk soon. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, guys.